middle class women who sued to ride in the first class ladies' car, black women railroad food vendors, and black maids on the Pullman trains. We often hear of the Pullman porters, but you never hear about the Pullman maids. And what I've learned in the book is there was usually one female per train where there would be multiple porters. So she carried the responsibility on her shoulders alone. But one thing I thought was really sweet was a section where they called the waiter carriers. Now these women uh, were essentially the first food trucks. And I think this is the, the, the best thing ever, but they utilized the platform space because they weren't really allowed at that time to go into the depots and the hotels. They would stay on the platform and carry these big platters called waiters. And um, they had fried chicken and homemade biscuits and they would sell them to the passengers. Well, it kind of became a bit of a contentious place for having them on the platforms. Well, they kind of got uh, banned, booted off the platform. The women would go in between the tracks, active tracks, to sell the chicken. To the, and the passengers were loving it. It was delicious. But she opens that section with a, a quote that says, when the automobile had not even reached the inventor's drawing board stage, when the railroad passenger coaches were wooden and heated by pot-bellied cold stoves, when soot, smoke, and ashes were spewed out of the smokestacks by locomotive engines, when most overland transportation was by rail, an institution was born in Gordonsville that it was destined to survive almost three quarters of a century before it succumbed to the onrush of progress. And she's talking about their business. And I just thought it was really sweet to find out that these women were entrepreneurs and they were able to make a living off of an industry that all but kept them out of it. And I just thought that was like such a neat story to be told and shared about the railroad. So I'm looking forward to reading more about the book, but if you get a chance and you find it interesting, there's the information and you can pre-order it. <laughs> it comes out in June of this year. And uh, she's, she's really put a lot of thought and a lot of effort in researching her book, so. Okay, so we'll get to our first inventor. So we've already gone from 1855, 1860, now 1870. Eliza Dexter Murphy. I couldn't find a picture of her. I wish I could have. But I was able to find her patent application. What she invented was the, the, uh, an improved system for the patent uh, wheel bearings. So in 1870, you got to remember in 1869, the Transcontinental <coughs> Railroad was complete. So one year after the Transcon was done, um, she had already de developed this device to uh, improve the, the bearing situation. So the bearings would get hot, get locked up, they get overheated, they'd seize, and we'd have derailments, which, you know, were not only just cantankerous, but they were fatal in a lot of situations. So her device, as simple as it may seem, was a life-saving device. So what she did was originally they would just soak rags in oil and shove them in the, the bearing box. And that sounds great, I guess, but they would either get bound up, they would get dried out too quick because of the amount of friction that was being applied, they would start to, start to disintegrate. So what she came up with was she started breaking down fibrous things like uh, cotton or hemp, uh, various things, and would soak these fine fibers in like a, a powder that was a soap stone powder. Then she twist them all together into a rope, a real tiny rope, and then weave the rope together into a mat. She wrapped that box of the journal in that mat. So the journal and the, the bearings could move freely. The friction was not a problem. Uh, they stopped having derailments, stopped having train delays. So her simple invention was such a big difference in the railroad. Hello? That's you, Peter. <laughs> Okay. It's going to uh, be next time. <laughs> but one thing that's really fascinating too is that she earned 16 patents for her invention. And I mean, we're talking again, 1870, y'all. Yes, ma'am. They didn't get a whole lot of money back then. She did sell it to the railroads, but, you know, unfortunately, women were not seen as business people and they kind of got taken advantage of. There is a story later on that we'll say where she did get rewarded for her uh, inventions. But yeah, women were just, you know, in society, the way that it was, we were just second class by most.
standards. So, but she was smart and she had 16 patents. That? There, there you go. Something like that, okay. So Mary Elizabeth Walton is the next one. Uh, so she actually has two patents, but to hers, 1879 to 1881. What she did was she developed an emissions control system, a deflection system, and a, a, a noise retarder. So her deal was that she was once quoted as having said, my father had no sons and believed in educating his daughters. He spared no pains or expense to this end. So she became pretty privy to how to survive, how to be ingenuity, the, the sense of ingenuity. She was a uh, border house, board house owner in New York City. She, her house was up against the elevated tracks, which is the L trains. So they're loud, they're noisy, they're disgusting. And she was getting really tired of this. And in the 1860s was the Industrial Revolution. So people were flourishing and running to New York City. So all this stuff was, uh, let's see, the, they could see and taste the air, which was tainted by oil, kerosene refineries, coal plants, varnish and fertilizer plants, factory smokestacks, the list just goes on. So what she did was she designed this device right here. So it was a water tank. So the fluids would go in, it would get dissolved into the water and be held in this water tank in suspension inside the locomotive. So when the locomotive was done or when it made it to its next destination, it would then be dumped into the city sewage system, which you know probably didn't help that matter as much, but <laughs> it did reduce a lot of the problems. And you gotta remember too, with steam engine, all that stuff was coming back in on the crews and you know they're breathing in all this bad stuff. I mean, my goodness, you know. So Right, and another lady, which I didn't include her in this, Olive Dennis, uh, she developed a ventilation system back in the 40s, 1940s, to help prevent passengers from dropping their windscreens and having all that mess come in. So she actually developed an air conditioning system for the rail cars. Um, so that solved one of her problems or reduced one of her problems. The other problem was the noise. You know, the apartments and the buildings were tall, the L was elevated. So it's several stories high. And as the wheels come screeching around turns, which they still do today, they screech and they're so loud, they're ear piercing. So my favorite part about this convention was, is the city of New York acknowledged it as a problem. So they called Thomas Edison and said, hey, we need your help. Our guy's miserable, nobody's sleeping. Can you help us out? He said, sure. I called Edison, I can do this. Six months later, he came back to the city and said, I have no help. I can't, I don't know what to do. Here came Mary. In three days, she rode the rails, stood on the platform, and it was said that she was all in her best dress, all suited up, and would sit on the rails and would just sit there and twist her head and listen to everything and look at everything. And everybody's like, what is this woman doing, you know? She was researching. She went home in a basement of her house. She had a whole model train set set up where she was building models of how to create noise retarders. So she came up with this box that sits into the, around the track. So the box is made out of wood. She coated it in tar to make it weatherproof, lined it with cotton and filled it with sand. Boom, noise retarders. So that was purchased by the New York City Metro Rail for $10,000. And she was given a royalty free or a royalty forever, excuse me, on her patent. So no one can ever take it. Uh, she was given that because she it was she had gone where no man had gone before with her invention, <laughs> including Thomas Edison. So she went to uh, England to try to peddle her new invention. And it didn't take the British uh, officials very long to grab it because if you have any history memory of the London fogs and the de devastation that happened, over there, um, they bought her invention too and started employing it over in Europe as well. And the Women's Journal was quoted as having saying, the most noted machinists and inventors of the century, Thomas Edison among them, had given their attention to the subject without being able to provide a solution when lo, a woman's brain did the work. <laughs> <laughs> and 
also to say that today she is a, a, a noted person that is discussed in the educational system as a, a STEM, uh, you know, female role model. So she's not somebody that's been forgotten or looked over by no means. So the next lady is Mary Riggins. So in 1890, she witnessed a horrible uh, crossing accident. Um, there really isn't very much information about her either, but I did find her patent where she designed the very first automatic crossing game. Uh, it was created out of using pulleys and different weights to counterbalance and lift the gates and whatnot. But just witnessing whatever it was that she'd seen was enough to her to call her to action. She she came up with something that worked, and you know, of course, now we have what we have today is crossing gates. All right, Sarah Kidder, uh, 1901 to 1913, she served as the very first uh, female president of a railroad in the entire world. Her husband once was the president of the Narrow Gauge Railroad in Nevada. He passed away, and he left her as the sole owner of the railroad, which came to the dismay of the board members and everybody else, you know, and a female, you know, for God's sakes, who'd ever thought. And, you know, her role before was just housewife, tended to, and she wasn't railroading, you know. Well, she stepped in and, and took over the uh, uh, Northern Electric Wellways in San Francisco, which I guess now you knows like the trolleys and things like that were starting to kind of come about. And wanted to expand their service and their roots. So they started offering her money. And she kept saying, no, no, no. Well, then finally she came up with a number that was so astronomical, which they never said what it was, but she knew they would leave her alone. And then they definitely did. And uh, she just kept at it. Well, an earthquake took out the, the electric railway. So her competition was destroyed. And she took advantage of that opportunity with PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, they were going to build a hydroelectric dam um, out at, let's see what lake was that, Lake Spalding Dam. And uh, so she contracted with them to haul all of their gravel and their sand. She made so much money doing this that she was able to pay her shareholders and stockholders dividends that have never been seen up to that time. So before, when her husband was pre uh, president, the highest he'd ever paid out was 5%. And according to the San Francisco Bulletin, they ran an article titled, Woman Runs the Road. They said, few railroads anywhere revel in a dividend of 10%. But what makes this one really remarkable is the fact that it was uh, earned under the direction of a woman, not only woman, the only woman in all the world who is an active steam railroad president. So she was able to not only take over, make it profitable more than it had ever been, and everybody loved her, you know, in her Wall Street. Everybody was excited. So she ran the show for about 10 years and then kind of took a back seat on the board of directors and then later retired from it. So the next lady, Dr. Mary Engel Pennington, um, in 1908, she created what we now call reefer cars, also known as refrigerated uh, cars. So she, in 1895, earned her bachelor's degree in uh, biochemistry. She was actually denied her, excuse me, she earned her PhD in 19, 1895. In 1892, she was denied the right to earn a bachelor's degree. So the college said, well, because you're a woman, we can't give you a bachelor's degree, but we'll give you a, a certificate of proficiency in biology. So she took it. And two years later, she graduated with a PhD, a year later followed with a fellowship from Yale University. So this woman knew her stuff. And one of the things that she excelled in was bacteria. She was a bacteriologist. She was really concerned with uh, the transportation of food to our troops across the nation and, and just the devastating effects that bacteria can have on the American health, you know. So she started, uh, So she started working towards that in the general public. First thing she did was she went to some food vendors and sampled some of their utensils, showed a microscope slide of ugh, what was on there. 
And now all of a sudden people are starting to boil, clean their utensils. So she's been instrumental in food health and food safety. Well, she got notice uh, during World War I, she served on President Hoover's War Food Administration as a uh, consultant. And what she did was, the original car, they just filled with ice at the top. Well, it did two things. One, when it came with fruit, it froze the fruit, which is ruining the fruit. But when it came to the meat, it was thawing out too quickly. It wasn't keeping the meat right. So the food was just getting ruined from one point to another. And she knew that that didn't make sense and it wasn't good. So she came up with a patented system where she developed the refrigerated car, insulated the walls, insulated the ceilings, piped that cold refrigerant through those pipes and it maintained a controlled environment, cool for the fruit, frozen for the meat, dairy food, dairy products going across the, the nation. So what happened was this opened up the market. Not only did it provide better quality food for Joe Public, but now every rancher, livestock grower, everybody now has a stake in the game and they can start selling their product and getting it across to you know, some of the more uh, uh, vulnerable communities, some of the higher end towns, Chicago's and things like that, are able to get a lot of the homegrown food a lot safer and a lot quicker. So her <laughs> role was, was pretty integral. What she did was she rode the rails 500 times after she found out there were 40,000 reefer cars of that previous, this, there are 40,000 of these, she rode the rails 500 times, found out only 3,000 of them worked. Uh, you know? So, can you imagine the food loss that was happening? Is there the refrigerant that she used? <coughs> no, it did not. It might be that they're in, in her patent design, but in that application, there's a lot of it. So, it might be in there. Yes, sir. There was an ice dock in El Paso, Texas, on the Southern Mississippi River. You know, I think there all was the high one. school, all the high school boys would work there and put the ice. Big, and they're big, 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 heavy blocks of ice. Fifty pounds, and they would throw them over a, a leather pad on their back. But these big pictures. That was still going on at the beginning of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So it took a long time for her invention to work its way through. It really world. did, and I mean, she was still marketing this stuff well after she discovered it. You know, it took a long time for it to really kind of take root. But it was 1919 that she was actually awarded the notable service mention for her contribution in the war effort. So it kind of gives you a little time for you know how long it took her. And in 1941, the New Yorker dubbed her as the Ice Woman, which most women would probably kind of shirk at that time. But she wore it as a badge of honor. So you know, go her. Oh. Okay, so we'll just start back here. We did Mary Vivian. Okay, so Mary Coulter. Now I'm only going to talk a little bit about her, but she played a huge role with the Harvey Houses, and we have one in Slate. If you haven't had the opportunity to stop by, it's a wonderful little place. And I'm on the board, so it's Peter. So I'm a little biased. But we also have several of these classes that revolve around the Harvey House. So I'm going to kind of let that class take her on more. But Mary Coulter was quite the woman from what I've learned. She graduated from the California School of Design in San Francisco. And according to the US Census, there were only 22 women in the entire United States that were architects. So she was one of 22 women. And although she was one of the first females, she's been quoted to be tough-minded, a Stetson-wearing dynamo who smoked packs of cigarettes a day, cursed and drank without restraints. <laughs> but she, she should have fit in real fine. Then. She would. <laughs> She's a railroader at heart. Um, but she worked meticulously to bring her vision to life. And Fred Harvey, he was such a pioneer when it came to employing women. Of course, we know of the Harvey girls. You've seen the Judy Garland movie, probably. Uh, probably knew someone who was a Harvey girl. Um, and so for him to take her on as another female and as his architect was such a great uh, opportunity for her. She worked with Fred for over 40 years, designing many of the Harvey houses. From my understanding, she did not design ours. It was a gentleman who did ours, but she did many of them, including the Kansas City Union Station. 
uh, she had a real affinity for the Southwest motif that art and design. So she employed that pretty much in everything that she did. You can see by this is the Kansas City Union Station. This was the old uh, dining counter there. And so you can just see there's elements that are, you know, Southwest design. There's actually turquoise inlaid around each of these lamps. Um, the ceiling, I mean, you know, come on, this lady had it going. <laughs> Here's a, a, a room, a dining room from the Fred Harvey House. Uh, the Harvey House in Clayton actually had some of these same patterns. So you can kind of see things repeated through her work. Um, but her most noted work is out of Grand Canyon National Park, and she has many places there. Um, this is one of them. This is called Phantom Ranch. I mean, it's built right into that cliff. You know, I mean, it's just amazing that she could see this in her mind, make it come to life, have Fred's backing, financial support, and encouragement when women, again, are not being encouraged to do anything. So it was such a great thing for her to, to be a part of the railroad. Fred Harvey uh, basically was the first fast food restaurant, and he built these houses about every 130 miles or so along the Santa Fe Railway, and well, at Ashton and Topeka and Santa Fe Railway. And so it was an opportunity for the passengers to get off, stretch their feet, enjoy some fine dining, lobster, and things like that. All his linens and stuff came from England and Ireland. He ate off real fancy platters, so you weren't treated like fast food restaurant but it's the only place for the next 130 miles or so and so her role was very important for the railroad for the passengers for the the train crews as they came through and so she's played a very very big role okay so just other notable stories we've got the santa fe railroad in slayton and in 1909 you know slayton is known as the town that the santa fe built so this is O.L. Slayton. He was a Lubbock business banker and rancher. And from what I have understood, and I've read it in these one of these books up here, the Slayton book, so I'm not a genius or anything. I'm a Fort Worth girl, so everything I've learned, I've learned. Uh, apparently, Lubbock and Slayton got into a little tiff several years back about who was going to be the county seat. And Tech was supposed to have been built between the two cities, and it somehow became built in Lubbock. So OL had realized that the Santa Fe had made a comment or somewhere that they wanted to connect Lubbock and Sweetwater with a rail ride. And he thought, all right, if we do it in Slayton, it'll bring business, it'll bring a boom, and that's what we need. So he went to the Santa Fe Railroad and made a deal to bring them to Slayton. I love it. Kind of got a little miffed about it. They wanted it too. And he's like, well, you can't have it all. You know, you got tech. We got the railroad. And so essentially, Santa Fe is what made Slayton hit the map. And I see pictures all the time of movie theaters in Slayton. And I mean, just crazy things. And I live in Slayton. And I'm like, wow, there's a theater here? You know? <laughs> so I mean, it was really a booming place at that time. You know, we had passenger rail that would pull up. There's the Hart House, what is now the Hart House. Then it was the depot. There was a Santa Fe reading room, and I've got a better picture of it there in a frame. There's this beautiful facility that the Santa Fe had built for the train crews, specifically in mind, to give them an opportunity to relax and rest uh, in between their long commutes and things. Because I can't imagine what it was like back then. I know what it's like today, and I try to put myself in that time, and I'm just dumbfounded at how they did it back then. But uh, so that reading room has since been destroyed, which is so sad to me. I don't I hope it was just because it was in such disrepair, but, um, you know, which is also the story with the Slate Harvey House. It was scheduled to be demolished, and a plumber came to turn the gas off because the wrecking ball was showing up, and he said, I can't believe this is happening. Can you give me a minute, you know? And he called somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, and they had people that showed up and raised, was it a million dollars or something, Peter? No, they basically sold it for $25,000. The railroad? Yeah. And then they raised the money to refurbish yeah, it. Yeah, the 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 yeah. So I wish we could have done the same for the reading room, but thankfully we were at least able to save the Harvey House. So this is a picture of the rail system that BNSF uses uh, at, the, at the moment. 
And I'm sure there's probably been some additions. I know we bought the Montana Rail Link or something not long ago, which is probably not reflected here. Um, but so you pretty much see we come down the west side, all on the south, about as far east as we go is Birmingham, Alabama. East Coast is kind of serviced by CSX, uh, Norfolk Southern, other railroads, UP, uh, Union Pacific. We kind of cross over with UP quite a bit. Um, but here's us. So here's Slayton, from here is Lubbock. So this is called the Slate subdivision. Right here is Clovis, New Mexico. Right here is Sweetwater. So it's 130 miles from Slayton to Sweetwater, 130 miles to Clovis. We go 136 miles up the Plainview sub to Amarillo. We can also come across the Herford subdivision. Uh, was it 336 miles? Long way. Yeah, that's yeah. Up, so we go triangle. Herford and come back down this way. So we yeah. pretty much go this whole triangle and then this little stretch down here. Um, that's our daily runs. Uh, it takes you, what, two and a half hours to drive? Amarillo takes me 12 hours and did some by train. <laughs> um, then I get to stay in a lovely hotel. Last trip I was there 30 hours, 28 yeah, 30, hours. 28, so. Yeah, so it can be two days before I come back home. Once I left at work for, let's see, 1 30 in the afternoon on Thursday and returned back at 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. So it can take you a long time to go these little short distances as it turns out by train. Um, most of that's because we're just big and heavy. Um, they're trying to save money on fuel, so they tell us not to go faster than this or faster than that. So that kind of slows us down. But generally, it's just because we have plenty of trains to meet. Uh, and we have to pull over, wait for that other train to go get by. So it's like a big game of leapfrog the whole way, essentially. Okay, so now talk about me. <laughs> So, ever since I was a little kid, I was apparently a tomboy. I never really had Barbie dolls, as you see there. I am with the General Lee. <laughs> and then, oh, I have a BN car that I'm holding up for my train set. So, apparently, I've always been kind of a tomboy, which kind of was a natural progression for me to be part of the railroad. Um, you know, it's not, it is a man's world, but it's not a man's job because I am doing it. Uh, but you kind of got to be a little rough and tumbly, I think, to handle it. You got to be a little rough around the edges. You got to be able to hold your own against the men, you know. Uh, but I had a guy that I knew that worked for Union Pacific, and he showed me his paycheck. That's pretty much what sealed the deal. Uh, I had no college. I was a high school graduate, single mom at the time. And the best I was doing is about 25000 a year full time. And then I had to go get another job for another 20,000 full time, killing myself for 40,000, 45,000 a year. And uh, when he showed me his check, I said, Oh my God, how much school did you have? He said, I drove a cement truck before this. You know? <laughs> I was like, Oh my gosh, I can do this, you know? And so I started looking, and my mom, she was trying to temper me, like, Okay, well, you know, just in case you don't get it, in case you don't make it, I'm like, I'm going to get it. So I had to take all these aptitude tests and things online to prove that I was smart, I guess. And then I had to take some physical tests, which so that one kind of intimidated me because I'm not a man and I'm thinking I, I'm, I'm not going to do well. And, and when I went, there was a, a table and they strapped me to the table. My legs were strapped and I was having to like push or pull against invisible things. There wasn't any, I was just strapped down. And I was like, okay. So I'm doing it, and then the guy turns the computer off and says, look, they can't see that I've turned the computer off, but they can see that you're failing. So if you really want this job, you need to go wherever you have to go to dig in there and give me what I'm asking you to do. Are you ready? And I was like, I guess. <laughs> he flips the switch, and I close my eyes, and all I could see was my son's face. And he's yelling at me the whole time. Dig, 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 you know? And I'm like, I'm oh, dirty, you know? And well, I get done, I said, did I pass? He goes, I can't tell you. Mm. Oh. <sighs> I went out to the truck and I was bald, like a baby. I was physically worn out, emotionally drained. I thought, I've gone through all this stuff and I just gave it up right here, you know? 
So I go about a week and then I get a letter in the mail. You've been invited to be a part of the new conductor class. That was so special to me. I was the first girl in my family to be a part of the railroad. So it was a big step, not just for me, not just for women, just for all sorts of reasons, you know. This was hopefully going to be a life-changing experience for me as a mom. I did not know how life-changing it would be for me as a person. Uh, it's been the best thing I could have ever done in my whole world. So I get hired on and we start class. Conductor class is 13 weeks. We had a pilot in our class. He said it was tougher than flight school. Oh, I don't know, but that's what he said. Um, it was pretty grueling. This is the rule book that we had to memorize and learn every day and just recite it by heart. It's now been reduced to that iPad, <laughs> which is nice for the, with the weight, but my iPad seems to like to buffer a lot and my pages don't buffer, you know, so I miss the paperwork. But so I'm doing pretty good in class holding my own and then I go out into the field for my on the job training. And that's where I started to realize I'm a girl. Uh, Little things that I would notice. I walk into a room and I'd approach the room. I could hear everybody talking, laughing, and I enter in dead silence. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I can kill a mood, can I? And I get my coffee and I sit down and they'd all just start looking at their phones. And I was like, so finally I asked somebody and I'm like, did I, did I do something wrong? He said, you're a girl. You're a threat. You're either going to take us to HR, human resources, because we're going to say something offensive. You're going to ruin a marriage or you're going to date everybody else. I'm like, no, I'm not though, you know. So then it didn't take me long to figure out I got to be a dude. <laughs> so I'd be the first one to tell the dirty joke. I'd be the first one to say a cuss word when I walked in the room. And I had to do that to disarm these guys. There were older gentlemen that were about to retire. And one of them came up to me and said, you know, women don't belong out here. And the only reason you got this job is because they needed a quota. And I said, maybe. That day I was the guy asking for a job, not the guy doing the choosing. But I'll tell you this, I took the same aptitude test all y'all took. I took the same physical test all of y'all took. So I guess you're telling me you're only as smart as and as strong as a woman. He just kind of thought, hmm. And that was the end of that conversation. I knew then that I was on my own. I had to hold my own. I couldn't be the damsel in distress. But at the same time, I didn't need to work harder to prove myself either. It was a lot harder. I, I came up in the Fort Worth terminal. That's where I hired out. People there are just different. They're just a different breed of all kinds of people. Uh, I couldn't believe when I came to Slate how different people in West Texas were from Fort Worth. Um, never got treated that way here. Never, not once. Uh, the guys in Fort Worth have knocked on my hotel door, begging to come in, uh, put their hands on me. Uh, that was when I was married, and I had to go to my husband, that's Jeff there, and, and tell him, I need your help. I've been in a situation. So that just the, the whole role of women is just not well respected in the man's world. No matter how much I try to fit in blend in and let me assure you I maybe to my own part but I do the job better than most of them do because I have a lot of passion it's not because I'm smarter I really do care I really do love what I do I love what it's done for me so it's a lot of value and I take a lot of pride in my work it's not just a paycheck for me or a means to it either. so um, as a woman it means a lot for me to be here and to be a representative for BNSF here at work at home so that's my little short story, <laughs> which takes me to my next favorite story, the love train. Here we are. So that's my <laughs> husband, Jeff. He's an engineer. He's been with the railroad 25 years in uh, June. And uh, so when I first came to Slate, and I came out here on a long now, uh, it's pretty much the same situation we're in right now. We have too many trains and not enough people to run them. And so they put a big call out and said, come help us. So I thought, you know, I'm going to go. My mom, everybody's like, you're crazy. You're going to leave your kid behind? He was with his dad. I didn't just leave him. 
And uh, I said, I don't know, there's just something in me telling me I need to go. Now I call it something, but I'm gonna tell you what I believe it is God. And when God speaks, I listen. And so I came, and there's like three or four guys that came with me from Fort Worth. We worked out here for about a week, and we finally met up, had a beer, started sharing our railroad stories. I said, John, I'm, I'm going to stay. I'm like, you're crazy. Who would give up Fort Worth for sleep? I said, something's telling me this is where I belong. It's like so real and so fire in me. I cannot say no. Oh, you're crazy. <coughs> Whatever. One day, I get called to go to work with J.A. Lockett. Gets the depot, and they're like, who are you working with today? I said, oh, Jay Lockett. Oh, he's the best engineer we've got. You're in good hands. Don't worry about it. I'm like, oh, thank God, because that's not what I've heard about some other guys. <laughs> and uh, we get on that train, and I, I'll say it was a 12-hour trip. It may not have been, but that was our first date, essentially, and they didn't even know. We got to share. We talked the whole way. We spent such a nice time together sharing our lives, our children, our goals, our dreams. We get to the hotel, and he said, I will probably not get to work back together tomorrow. Sometimes we get messed up with the hotel. I said, well, you know, so I'm like, so cute. I mean, I actually like that kind of cute girl. <laughs> and uh, I remember as I went into my hotel door, I looked and I watched him walk down the hall. Oh, man, you know. Sure enough, I called the next morning, Jay Long. We got to come home. He let me run a, a loaded coal train from about yet through mill shoe or whatever. It's on the second time I'd ever been behind the controls of a live locomotive, not to mention one that's 15, 16,000 tons. I mean, massive responsibility. And I'm just hauling balls through the town, you know. It's like, this is so cool, you know. And so we get done. And shortly after that, I got recalled back to Fort Worth. Well, he texted me a time or two, uh, work related. Our, Paychecks got messed up or something for the trip we were on. Then I got a text. Hi, pretty girl. What are you doing? Oh. Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I literally did that. I was in my bathroom. I remember it like it was yesterday. So we've never been apart ever since. Little did I know that feeling I felt wasn't just God. It was God telling me, you belong here. You're going to meet your husband here. You're going to buy your dream house here. You're going to live out your dream job here. I mean, like, massive plans i had no idea just to pull in my gut you know and so getting to work with my best friend is, is really cool what took us we got married in 2016 then we went to fort worth we didn't get to work together there that's just not the way it was set up it took us nearly four years before we came back here on october the 5th 2020 before we had two lock of on our working ticket and so we were called the love, the love train. We were on a train called the Love Temple, which is a love it to temple. That's how they uh, named the trains. So we were on the Love Temple. It sounded a lot like love. So, oh, hello, Love Temple. And I was like, Love Train. So the dispatchers even call us the Love Train when we're together. And it's just kind of become a thing. So we end up getting a grand marker at the Slate Party House because we are Slate's first husband and wife train crew. So we're kind of a a historical piece in and of ourselves. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. And I think that's just, that's it. So do y'all have any questions about what I do or what I said or anything at all? Go ahead. I'm the only one in Lubbock. Uh, but there are other women on the railroad who are the minority. I did email BNSF a time back to see if I could get a raw figure to give you guys. Um, but I don't know if they just lost my email or didn't care. But um, in Fort Worth, there was about 10 of us, and that's one of the larger terminals. I think there's probably maybe 10 out of Amarillo. But, I mean, you're talking out of a terminal with 500, 700 people. So big-time minority, you know, for sure. Uh, but I don't have an exact number. But there are lots of women who are engineers, uh, lots of women who are conductor-only. I'm a conductor-only. He's an engineer and conductor. It, engineers are promoted level from conductor. I just am so happy with what I do and I don't want to change it. So I don't want to get behind the controls at all. Um, but yeah, there's, I'm the only one out of it. We had one, I'm sure probably some people there were Carol along. Um, she worked here for a long time. She's now moved on to other parts of the railroad. She's no longer here. So now I'm the, I'm the namesake. Yes, yes ma'am. I wanted to ask that when you just almost explained it, the difference between the engineer and the conductor. So what do you do as conductor? Okay, so.
So if you kind of think of me as the pilot of the airplane, so he technically drives the train um, and controls it the whole way, which is a massive responsibility. I sure don't want to reduce it. But what I do is, and not so much anymore because technology is changing, but I would have to tell him where to stop, when to slow down, when to speed up. Uh, I would like, communicate with the dispatchers on the radio. I do all the radio talk, maintain all the manifest paperwork, all the hazardous material paperwork. Um, generally, I start off getting my paperwork, and then I build my train from scratch. Get your engines from that track, get that track and that track, and put them together. I have to go through and line them up with these air hoses, crawling underneath and between the cars, lining up all these air hoses together for the brake pipe system, uh, testing the brake pipe system, making sure that it's active and working. Once I get all that done, then I can get on the head end with him, and then we take off wherever it is that we're destined to go. Sometimes I have to pick up cars in Plainview on my way to Amarillo or set out cars in Snyder on my way to Sweetwater. Um, so I have to get out and do the work. If the train breaks apart, I have to get down there and fix it. Um, a lot of times those nut holes are about 75 pounds male to metal. Um, the weight, the buff forces and things can just snap them, snap them right in half. And generally they're about a mile back. <laughs> and I have to go back there. And go back? Yes. And you know, it's the hardest. I, I did not as part Billy Goat, but I mean the, the sides of the tracks are like this. You're carrying heavy things on slipping rocks. I've got back issues now at you know my age, but um, it, it can be pretty scary when you have wildlife. We got wild pigs like crazy down in sweet water. We've seen mountain lions in sweet water, rattlesnakes. My, the one I'm afraid of the most is the skunk. When I see Pepe, I go running. <laughs> There's just no if and or buts about that. Uh, but yeah, so I have to go out there and fix it. Sometimes, even though, uh, let's see, who was it? Eliza Murphy that could have created the bearing system? Um, we still have those issues. <clears throat> And we have actually detectors along the side of the tracks and they'll alert the dispatcher will call me and say, you need to go back and check axle number 654, <sighs> way back there. <laughs> and I'll have to get down and go. And I've got uh, a crayon that I have to touch the wheel bearing with <coughs> and now it's at a certain temperature or I've got a handy dandy laser at the lawn I can shoot it right at the wheel and it'll tell me what the temperature is. And if it's too hot, then I have to take the car out of my train go to the next safest place to stop my train, set that car out, go on about my merry way. And generally once I put my train together in Slate and I go to Amarillo and I take it apart, all that work, you know, so we build it in Slayton and then we take it to Amarillo, like a, a love ams, love it to Amarillo, build it here, put it all together, pick up and plant you, get to Amarillo, rip it apart, take the power to the roundhouse. It's a full day, a lot of physical work, a lot of mental work, um, I had an engineer the other day who's been out here almost as long as he has, and it was like it was his first day on the railroad. I was like, oh my God, what happened? You know, and I mean, I had to carry his job and mine that day, so I was mentally exhausted from trying to maintain both sides of the cab at that point. It was that So, did you carry? Okay. No, and I probably should because interestingly well, enough, the critters. Yeah. Well, the critters. <laughs> about three or four weeks ago, I had a man try to enter my cab. Well, I know what you're saying. We can meet ruffians that you worked in. That was care. probably the scariest thing I've ever had. I've had a suicide in my train. That uh, was my first incident. I've, I've hit a John Deere tractor. Uh, I've hit a big box truck. Um, so I, I, it's usually me against you, and I'm going to win every time. Uh, <laughs> This time I felt the opposite. So when we pulled up our train to stop, it was my job to get out and line a switch. So it was bend the metal, bend the tracks so my train could go with parking. And I went down to use the bathroom, which we do have bathrooms and I do clean them. They're like sloshing porta potties. And it's disgusting. <laughs> so I went down to use the restroom. My engineer said, you're not going out there. I'm gonna go line that switch. I said, why? He said, well, there's this guy. He was sitting on the tracks when I pulled up. He was like, Following up at the track, if he's gonna headbutt us or something, I'm like, well, that's weird, you know. He said, You look out that window, and I'm gonna get down there and run this switch. I'm like, okay, so I'm looking, it's like 8 30 at night, it's still getting dark. I'm like, so the fence post, I'm kind of look at it, kind of I side eye it, you know. Put the fence post, and all of a sudden, the fence post broke out to a dead sprint running towards me. I was like, oh my god, about that time, my engineer hops on. 
But we see him climb on the second engine and he ran through that engine lightning fast and was up at our back door. And before we could realize it, my engineer was able to lock the door, which almost never happens. They're so old. These are engines built forever ago. They just get repainted. And um, so luckily it lost. He's banging on the door, kicking it, you know, and, and we're like hiding in the corner because we don't know if he has a gun. So we're trying to stay out of the window. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he swings around and hangs off the side of my engineer's window and he's looking at us. Like, we're like this. <laughs> and he's talking to us. And he's hanging on by finger, like fingernail. Like, are you moving awesome. at this? Uh, we're totally stuck. <laughs> and uh, he's like, you need to get off this train. Why? He says. You know, and like, we called the cops. And I'm on the radio begging for help, you know. I, I knew he was on a train and I knew he was coming into Lubbock. And all I could say, please do not be hearing me. Call out and distress off that radio, you know, because that would mess him up. And uh, so I was like, we need help. We need help. And the cops came, they found him. Apparently, he had some mental health issues. <laughs> and uh, they took him to some sunny place psychiatric facility to get the help that he needed. But for the first time ever, I felt vulnerable. And that one kind of took me to a different place, you know, because I thought as soon as he came by the window, my engineer was, I don't think I'll lock that window. We're 16 feet in the air. We don't really want to think yeah. to lock the window. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, this is how this is going to go down right here. You know, it, it might, this might be how it ends, but I'm not leaving. It's me and him against whatever that guy's on. And I'm thinking, drugs and that kind of mental place that he's in and the strength that he must have is hanging off my engine for crying out loud but uh, luckily it worked out for everybody so they have a rule that says i can't carry a gun but i can carry a three inch pocket knife i have the idea that bear spray, bear spray would be good yeah I, and i'll just be a little bit Longer, but my thought was at that time I've got steel toe boots, you've got balls, teeth, and eyeballs, and I'm going for all three of those places. Right. You know, so that was my only defense. My engineer had two three-inch knives. I mean, might as well have had butter knives. That I mean, if, if you're close enough to get with three, you're too close. Yeah. If you're too bad with that. So um, I have walked up on pigs in the middle of sweet water that maybe jump up on a car. You know, definitely don't want to get. I'm mad at you, you know, but there's definitely been times where you just, you realize your vulnerability as a human being, much less as a female out there, you know. We used to live in Albuquerque, we drive from here to Albuquerque many, many times, and we see all these trains, and there's a lot of trains in this area. We'll drive along, we go going along, and here's a train that's got four engines on the front. We'll look at it, well, that's got four engines. Oh, look, that one's got two on the back. How about the half? There was a two in the middle. One in the middle. <laughs> what, what determines what you do there? And money. So the railroad has figured out that they can cut jobs. Like, I mean, you know, Walmart's doing self-checkout. It's just the way the world works, you know. They realize they can put two trains together, get it there at the same time, and only use one crew to do it. So they don't really care that they're messing up your crossings, that they're making you late for work. Or anything like and that. And you too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they care that they're saving money on my salary, my insurance benefits. They care that they're saving fuel. So the trains are getting bigger and longer. When I first hired out, they were average about 5,500 feet to about maybe 85, 9,000 feet. So about a mile, mile and a half. Now they're 16,000 feet. Up to 16. So that's three and a half miles or so one way. So I have to walk, like if it's a hazardous train and we get a Hot journal. I have to walk the entire train. So that's three and a half miles one way, three and a half miles back. So six miles to walk your train. Yeah. Uh, we, my daughter used to live in Kent, and there's a double track there where you guys park. That's a side. All side. the time. Mm -hmm. And All one time, my daughter was in Oxford, like four or five years ago. My daughter, I, we were visiting from Albuquerque, and uh, my daughter said, Well, go outside and look at the train. So I go out and look out the window, and there is a train full of army tanks. Yeah. And there must have been 30 or 40 cars of it. So I walk across with my camera, and I'm sitting there taking pictures of it. And I hear this voice say, 
Emergency from the rear, if need be. Yeah. Okay. So I can do it from the head end or the rear end. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's why. Uh, that's why you were able to start out. I guess that's your career progression is. Now it's conductor, conductor to engineer. We used to it was brakeman all the way up. Is that still two different? Um, Yes, yes, it is. Two different crafts, two different. He's products. part of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineering Training, BLET, and I'm part of the SMART, which is the sheet metal, air, rail, and transportation. Uh, so we deal with a lot of different transportation industries in our union. And I just recently became an elected union official, so that's a whole new learning experience. <laughs> <sighs> So. Just to kind of further that too, they, they say a lot of women are, are really good engineers because they have a softer touch than a man does. A man, after a certain period of time of running the train or, you know, switching in the yard or something like that, we, we kind of don't worry about the equipment so yeah. much, you know. It's funny that you say rough. that. Because yeah. he used to say when he would train other engineers coming up, he's like, you're not hauling eggs back there, rip on it, man. Yeah. <laughs> but then I took him, metal. I went and bought him a truck. I went from a 95 Chevy Silver, what is it, a Silverado? C71. C71. Yeah, and I bought him a car. brand new King Ranch. Whoa. Right after, he gets it, he's like, Babe. I thought like there was a bunch of babies in the back. I was like, rip on it, man. You're not hauling eggs. You know? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, there, there's definitely a difference in how they run. Some of them are really, really rough. And so I learned real quick, I'm not riding with that guy. You know, I had a guy that's a really great engineer, but he ripped me off the side of the car one day. Not his fault. It's just shoving uphill physics. It was a bad situation. And by the time I got off the train to the hotel, I couldn't get my pants off because my knee had swelled. So, bad. so I said, you know, you start to realize how people run. You just protect yourself. He runs really good, especially when he knows I'm on the train. <laughs> but, you know, people make light of it. Like, oh, I bet y'all, how can y'all stand working together? Or I bet you love working together. But the truth is, that's my toughest train. That's both my paychecks on that train. That's both our livelihoods. That's 
you know, not, nobody's at my house when we're both on the train together. So I protect that time fiercely, more so than I do time with anybody else because it, it costs me everything I've got going to sleep. What kind of walk resulted along the track? I don't know what the ballast is made out of. I'm Generally, not sure the type of rock. They come in they have small boulders, and we take them to rock crushers. We got rock crushers all through like Oklahoma and different places that we used to spot our trains, and they would crush up those boulders, turn it into the ballast, and then we take it. A big one. Better now, and we yeah. we dump the ballast as we go from the bottom of the belly of the train. So. Any Go ahead, go ahead. Like serious stuff. This is always a question. There's so much graffiti yeah. on the cars now. And we used to they clean it off, clean it off. Now I notice it's just on the I can't keep up. So I let it go. I can't keep up. So I just love this it. on there. Just let it go. <laughs> yeah, there it go. I love it. I think it's a form of art. I mean they're doing I the naughty thing that. and painting on something that's not theirs. But I mean if you look at some of these paintings and you realize how many different colors of paint, how many cans can of spray paint it took on the time is it? I mean, that's like impressive on a lot of that. The problem becomes where it actually gives job, creates a job, is they do it on the, the car haulers that haul the automobiles. So then the overspray gets on the auto cars. So when they offload at the auto plant, now some dudes have come by and buff all that stuff out. So they created a job. They got a buffer. <laughs> or it covers up our car numbers. So they, they actually are pretty good at not covering up the numbers. They're pretty sad with these guys, you know. And a lot of times these trains are parked for several hours. So they've got ample opportunity to just get up there. I mean, there have been some phenomenal pieces. And one thing I think is funny, and again, a little crude, almost on every car you'll see a man's thingy. And I'm like, of all the things that people could draw on these cars, <laughs> why? Is it that you know? And there's one on every car. I'm like, it's almost like a game I play when I'm in there. There's not how many. There's another one. You know? <laughs> I don't know why. That's a thing. But yeah, no, no, no creativity. I guess. <laughs> no, it's not original at all. Okay, no, I'm yeah. sorry. You're fine. <laughs> okay, as as my husband was saying, and Anne went beside me. And we used to go visit the state, but and that thing never moved. That, that set of cars stayed there for a long time. Why? What was it doing there, and why did it stay there? I'd like to have a better answer for you then. A lot of times, it's just either the customer's not ready for it. Uh, a lot of times, they don't have a crew to take it. Um, or storage. A lot of times, as you'll see at Andrew, our stacks, like a double stack containers stacked up, a lot of the finished cotton seeds. So it's cotton bales waiting yeah. to be gin they've somewhere. been sold. No, the the, the the gin bales in those containers waiting to go to the port. And so once we get enough of those together to uh, make a train. To, yeah, to make a train to send to California, then as me and her go to work, we'll we stop and pick those up along the way. And then travels on to California to the ships and gets what loaded. Talking about when our daughter lived on one side of the railroad tracks, she had a barn on the other side of the railroad tracks. We walked across the railroad tracks over there, and uh, she actually put some paintings. Of course, she did. I didn't do that. Our grandson to mash it, you know, and that's totally what they can do. Yeah. <laughs> can, you really, can you really get in trouble? I mean, you really have any problems with problems. And I mean, like with your situation with the, the tanks, they're just having to be a cop watch it. No. 99.9% .9 of the time, he will not get noticed. That's <laughs> always Until the next time. Yeah, until the next time. You stay next time. Because <laughs> after the first wheel goes over, it's yeah, gone. Can, it's gone. Go yeah, you had mentioned about the, phys the physical test that you had to do. Do you have to do that each year? Do you still, I mean, I guess if no, you do your job, one and done kind of yeah. deal, and thankfully so, because half of us would be unemployed. Uh, most of us are overweight, caught with blood pressure pills, sleeping with CPAP masks. <laughs> We were probably the most unhealthy bunch you'd ever meet, you know, in a, in a single group of people. So, yeah, luckily it's a one and done. Well, and, and then you had talked a bit about what the trains are carrying. 
So primarily, you know, you talked about from Lubbock to Amarillo or Sweetwater. What primarily are, are on the trains? So when he was talking about going to Albuquerque, those trains have a lot of our high priority for FedEx, UPS, Amazon, Walmart. So those are our extreme high priority trains. That's the transcon that runs across there. And so those are 70 mile hour trains. They're getting There's to the things but what like we that carry too. is called Manifest. Uh, we don't have any high priority freight out of Lubbock. So we do a lot of coal trains, lumber, the refrigerated cars like we talked about, lots of beer, wine, uh, food, TVs, toothbrushes. I mean, everything. Pretty much everything you use today to get here, to hear about the railroad steel. came to you by the A lot of steel. A lot of steel. Yeah, a lot uh, of steel plates. Flat steel plates, uh, uh, you know, billet aluminum blocks that they put into the box cars. Telephone poles. Yeah. All kinds of yeah. I mean, because, like, really, like with the lumber, especially, uh, it would collapse the semi truck if it were to pull it. You know, the, the sheer weight alone would just fold it in half. So that's where trains come in real handy because they can handle a whole lot more abuse. Yeah, those average loaded cars are 130 tons. Wow. That's, that's kind of an average. There are some that are heavier, some that are lighter. And just a piece of information to add to that. Those engines are 200 tons. Wow. 400, well, 4,400 horsepower. 4, yeah, 4,400 horsepower and, and 200 tons. And they're about two stories high. They don't look that, but they are. They stop on a dime. Yeah. Most of the time. <laughs> they will run 70 miles an hour. You would be surprised. Uh, you'd be surprised how quickly they can stop. But for a lot, yeah, most part it is. It takes a long time. Cattle. We used to do cattle. So another tidbit about women, uh, a, a lady named Kathy Wilkerson was a rancher's daughter and she developed the cattle car using some rank opinion mechanisms to create a safer, more friendly place for the livestock to exist and uh, to keep them separated from the water and the feed at the same time. We used to do a lot of cattle, um, but with the invention of the reaper car and did away with our need to handle cattle. But up until a few years ago, we did circus trains and Marlon Bailey was still a thing. And uh, that was something that we got the privilege to do in Fort Worth. It was a pretty wild experience. I never got to operate the train itself, but when I worked at the yard, the clowns and the carnies like lived on the train in the yard. And we'd be out there switching cars and a dude would run by on a unicycle, you know? <laughs> it was like two in the morning. I'm like, <laughs> you know, when you're out there hooting and hollering, like, what is going on? Like, that train used to come to Lubbock and then they would walk all of their livestock from the depot down to what's the building that they did away with? The Coliseum. The Coliseum. Yeah, the Coliseum. But uh, they walked them in a parade down there. Yeah. Those are hard trains. You have to stop off and let the people come out and feed and water the animals and stuff like that. So they're kind of hard trains to operate. A lot of frequent stops, but Albuquerque used to have a, a facility next to their steam shop where they rebuilt and refurbished all of their uh, circus trains. Oh, yeah, it's, it's right next to the steam shop. It's, you've probably seen it on Breaking Bad or oh, that, yeah. oh, that yeah. big steam shop. It's still there. And the, the other building, I think they tore it down, but that was the where they redo the surface trends. And I don't think you have to be a huge fan of the railroad to appreciate the architecture of the buildings that they had and just the beauty that they were, the depots, or I just think everything about the railroad is so beautiful in a, in a weird way. I think it is. You know, it's the most filthy, dirty place ever, but it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Especially when it snows. I, there's something I like better than being the first train to a nice a big pile of snow. I've so come quiet. around the corner at Amarillo and saying, I love you before oh, yeah. in the snow. So this one, <laughs> I was sitting at a, at a sign for like three, four hours. I thought, I'm just bored. It's like I have a room. And I made a sign that NASA was coming to see because I think I let her eye with about six feet of snow. And I put a big eye and I was like, oh, this is a big heart, a big jet. Because I knew he was coming around the corner. Oh, and that's for me. Yeah. So I was like, okay. 
press the old train so the Slayton and there's Fairfax and there's Canadian Pacific, there's Northern Discovery. What's the deal on all of the different? Those are that. leased the engines a lot of times, or or the railroads sometimes share that. power. Uh, <coughs> it's kind of a payback type system, you know what I mean? Like uh, I borrowed some of your engines, so now you get to put so many hours on our engines. So we share a lot of things like trackage, like we can go from Sweetwater to Fort Worth on the Union Pacific tracks once a day. Um, that's the agreement we have to share trackage. So a lot of the railroads are competitors, but they're in it to win it together. So where are sure it came from? Uh, yeah, Amtrak runs on freight rail. Um, so that's the only way they survive. Yeah, they, they have, you can tell us right right. like in Europe they have passenger rail and then they have freight rail, so they don't really jive together. But over here in America, it's shared the same rail. And out of Fort Worth, I dealt with Amtrak a lot, and that's the bane of my existence. Passengers were priority, and I would literally sit still for six, seven hours waiting for Amtrak to come by and then come and go by like within a second. Three more. <laughs> now we can all start moving, you know. And I've learned how to entertain the voices in my head. <laughs> you learn how to get creative, you know. And I'm always on the right, my chest clean. I'm like, I'm making a to do list. It's like, I don't care if it's a to do list when I grow up, if it's a to do list when I get home, I'm just over there trying to. Stay to the work. Yeah, Amtrak would hold us out for hours. But we would also get deadheaded, uh, which is what we call it when we're not on the train, we're in a taxi. We could ride Amtrak. So we'd get on Amtrak, go to Temple or Oak City. A bunch of us railroaders would get on there together, ride the train to Oak City, go to the hotels for the night, wake up, come home on different trains. So, great stuff. You have to worry, you don't worry about wind. I know yes. you really get the wrong on those container trains, like you see, like I'm going to Albuquerque to FedEx and stuff, we do have to watch it. Uh, we have wind restrictions that we have to pay attention to. We have empty containers, what we call empty over empties. That's like a big sailboat, and they will blow over all the time, and there isn't anything we can do about it. Um, they try to put it on us a little bit, like they'll tell us, if you feel it's safe to, to move your train, like, oh, come on, you know, let me whip out my anemometer real quick and see how the I just learned the flag is standing out at 35 mile an hour and I'm not moving. You know, so yeah, the, the whip can be a, a big issue. It can stop us and delay freight for a long time. Stop if it's too much. That there's storms, tornadic type weather, they they position us, they just will back into sightings butt to butt. One night we were in a storm together at Bill Sudan. And he was, you know. 5,600 feet or so, six miles, mile and a half, and about a mile, mile and a half, we're head to toe. And he was showing me pictures from his phone of this horrific storm passing over his, and I'm like, it's sunny back here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is so weird, you know? Where are you? <laughs> yeah, it seemed like he was like in a Which whole we're not time, supposed so. to be doing, all, you know, with our phones. <laughs> Some things we get away with, but all of that's when we're stopped. Yeah, right. When we're moving, Phones go off, all electronics go off. That was my biggest challenge yeah. at first as a mom, single mom, turning my phone off for 12 hours and yeah. like leaving my kids behind, you know. And you're always like holding your breath and you're turning your phone on. And I, I got one message one time I thought I was going to die. And I'm like, okay, don't freak out. Okay, well, I'm freaking out. Okay. <laughs> for the first time in their lives, my children obeyed, did exactly what they were told, and washed both the dogs, but they decided to run two hair dryers at one time and blew the house out. <laughs> So <laughs> I was like, that's it. Oh, God. Thank God that's all it was, you know? <laughs> so just the antics that you have to put up with, you know? Things that you don't think about, you take for granted. When was the last time you turned your phone? Like, oh, never. You, know, you sleep with it on next to your bedside, and we just, we have to turn ours off. So it can be, we got elderly parents and chemotherapy, and you know, life goes on. While we're on the train, and it's some it's scary sometimes turning it off. What we have to do. Questions? Thank y'all so much for coming and for taking an interest in what I do, what we do, and the role that women have played over the history of the railroad. I hope that I taught you something new, some stuff that you didn't know. I learned a lot doing it. I'm thankful that Peter 
approached me one day and he's like, hey, would you like to talk about yourself for a while? And Mandy, I appreciate you being here because I know how difficult it is to, to set the time. Yes. Because you don't really get Well, and our schedules have changed dramatically. And when I first took this on, it was, we had seven days off a month that we could choose from. Now we get one day off a month. Wow. So it's pretty, pretty different. We're going through some legal battles with the company. The unions have sued and it's issue of like slave labor. It's pretty, pretty bad, pretty bad. I don't want to talk bad about them. Uh, it's just they're doing what they got to do. We're doing what we got to do. But in the meantime, it makes it incredibly challenging to be a part of things like this or part of those party house meetings of this last couple. Um, oh, we still give you chops. So don't <laughs> worry about that. <laughs> but I was super thankful that we could both be here today. He, he doesn't normally get to do this with me. I do. This is my first adult class, which was super exciting. I've done a lot of uh, schools, and scouting events, and things, and I get questions like, "Do you get to take your dog on the train? Do you have a bed on the train?" So it's nice to have like different questions and talk about different things. I was do you get the choice of that? I mean, like community service, or what do you call this? It's and, all on my own. It has nothing to do with the railroad. Um, well, that's the answer. Thank yeah. you. That's what I it's just something that I have a passion for. I really yes. just enjoy what I, I can do. see. That. Love to share it with people. So anytime I get that opportunity, through hell or high water, I'll make it happen. Very so good. it's exciting. There's a couple of things I got up here today. If y'all want to take a look, I borrowed from the Slate Museum. Y'all are welcome to look at anything or whatever. I've got a room of, of a, a lot of different things, World War II mostly, but I can make room for that if you can. <laughs> <laughs> if we could go back and forth, she would have my high. So I'm going to decline. I'm from the museum at Slate, so Becky Ford would be on the other side. Hunt me down. Oh, I might be afraid of skunks, but I'm real afraid of that. <laughs> that old style lantern like that. I wish I had one, but yeah, yep. that, those are me. This is what we have now. You know, and it's so funny too, like in our personal that way life. She can, I can see her. Though. Our personal life, we railroad without realizing it. You know, so like if your husband's back and in the boat or whatever, you're usually like, yeah, yeah, come on, come on. Well, I'm back there, so we're like giving hand signs <laughs> and Mark come in and I'm telling him what to do. So he's just watching me in the mirror, you know, and we do our railroad hand signs and stuff. So we do it without even realizing yeah. it, you know. No, it does come in handy sometimes. <laughs>
let me know, give me a little tune. I was doing an online Zoom class for these kids. And I was like, hey, everybody stand up and do the horn. And they all stood up and they're doing this. And here comes like a fun, 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 fun. The kids like freaked out. You know? <laughs> so it's just real exciting, you know. That's a big deal too. Is it so is. like, you know, for us, right. it's something that we do every day. So we don't really you know, think that much of it. But when you see the little kid, with his daddy or his mama. I love that horn. Gotta blow, blow the horn. It's not lost on me. It's an American tradition still. It is. That's right. And, that's and I right. get to enjoy every little boy string job. And that's something yeah. that is very real in my mind every day. And I'm always looking. We've got what we call farmers, real excited people that take pictures of our trains. <laughs> and uh, I guess you're kind of a little farmer, right? And uh, they'll take pictures of any kind of train. Sometimes there's one time we had a heritage unit that had some special decals on the side, and they followed us every crossing from Sweet North to Hunter. And uh, they just get real excited, but I think it's really cool. I mean, no one does that to the Walmart reader, you know. I actually thought that one was going to get us some big trouble because we, we let like them come up on the engine. They were kids. And then they hashtagged us in a they, email, oh. and the railroad showed up at their house. Wanting to know if they snuck on the engine. Oh, yeah. That was a bit of a stink. Luckily, they didn't, they didn't say nothing to us. And after that, it, because it was. Andy I think it's I, because it we was. Like, like, that was a wake up. Like, we can't do that. <laughs> that was both of our paychecks right yeah, there. Yes. Yeah. So. I can remember always going, woo, 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 you know, standing by the train track when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the person. If I see it, I'm going to blow the whistle for yeah. you. <laughs> is that a CB radio or is it a special radio with a special frequency? Yes. Nobody else can listen to it. Well, you can pick it up on I scanner, but on scanner the, and, yeah, it's, it, it is BNSF's channels. Yeah, private yeah. channels. But a scanner would pick it up? I think so yeah. because the plumbers, they have access to radio and they know when we're coming through and they get all excited. Yeah, somebody showed me a YouTube video of me copying on a track warrant one time. I showed the train and then I had my voice attached to it. So they were listening to it on scanner. And uh, since then, I've never been able to find that YouTube video again. But a friend showed that to me and I thought, how did they get that? But I, I figure it was a scanner. But now with these longer trains, they're kind of pointless, 16,000 feet. You're not going to hear anything I say. So it makes it really tough to communicate. I'm going to hold them up in the air. And that's how I got flung off that car that one time. Coming uphill, I'm holding my radio on the air, trying to hang on to the car, talking to my mic, and the engineer can't hear me. He's under a bridge. I'm up on top of a hill. It's just perfect storm. And he rips on and oh, off I, off I flop. So they've even had to go to extended links to, to keep the end of train telemetry. Uh, but it's a radio signal that goes to the lead unit, and uh, because of the links have gotten so long, they they've had to up that signal using the middle distributive power past the boost. So, that gives you the idea how long they are. Yep. So, you got lost the train? Almost. It slung me around. Yeah. Slammed me into the side of it. I had one arm, one hand on it. That, that was a rough ride. When you watch the movies where the guys are fighting on top of the train or whatever, y'all like that it never happens. I, I mean, like to tell people my life is exactly like unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> so exciting, you know. But really, it's so not that way at all. It's much more boring, less dramatic, yeah. but it's funny. We have our moments that get exciting, but. We try to stay away from exciting moments. That's usually a sign of Unstoppable is pretty hard to watch. Like, if you were a cowboy watching the Western, you'd say, oh, they couldn't do yeah. that. Well, we did a whole bunch of that. But yeah. oh, once you got to take, yeah. 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 take into consideration is the actual story. Yeah. And so the story was real and that was true. But I did have to up, so hit much. that red button. The guy was going to shoot with this gun one time. I had an engine come up on the UP sub that was on fire, um, and I had to shut the fire off. So that was exciting. So, yeah. 
never a dull moment when I'm on a train. <laughs> 25 years ago, I haven't even seen half the stuff you've seen. I'm like, I know, I don't know if I'm like a black cloud or what, but it's, well, I've always got a tail to tail for sure. Can I tell you about Dale? Yeah. <clears throat> when I was eight years old, my mother was supposed to meet us at the El Paso Southern Pacific train station, and she got stopped by a freight train that couldn't get to the station. No. So my dad bribed the conductor to stay an <laughs> extra 10 minutes, and then we took off. So his little boy and his dad were headed to New York City. <laughs> I got to sit on the, because my mother wasn't around. Right. So my dad left the Black Porter uh -huh. to take me to the station between two Pullman passenger cars and sit me on a rail, I mean on a platform, yeah. let my legs dangle over oh, my gosh. <laughs> and look down as we went over the Mississippi River. strapped to these harnesses and I'm like well how my gosh like Hannibal Lecter you know and now <laughs> you tell me stories that you weren't even strapped into anything you know like, the the black grab them and bubble wrap yeah. kind of had the back of my pants yeah. <laughs> he was holding me because I was he had to way out I wanted to oh, slip right oh my that's... gosh <laughs> well uh, to the side of that they're all boys they look like men but they're all boys and when you go over a railroad bridge they all have to lean over and spit and watch it oh. and I'm like as a girl I just never think of those things you know but they're just boys you get the chance to pee off the side they pee off the side <laughs> and I tell them I clean the bathroom I'm like oh I have to get off the side you never want to do that in Lubbock <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. With a wind ball. Into the wind, yeah. You gotta, be aware, you gotta be aware of where you're at. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Same for Bridges me. Are tough too, because that wind comes from underneath. Yeah, we go on those crossings; they're pretty rough, you know. And I've made the mistake of not paying attention and went down to the bathroom, sitting on the porta potty again, oh. and it's With like, the blue stuff. oh, 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 no. oh, no. oh no. <laughs> My worst bathroom story was I was in a nasty switch engine. These are like really gross. And I had to go to the bathroom and it was the light didn't work. So now I'm doing it in the dark and there's this pop-off valve. <laughs> and it's falling into the bathroom and so I'm hovering in the oh. middle. And this thing is right in my face and I don't know it. It goes and I fall back all over that. I was like, oh my God. And my friend come down and busts so oh, what's the matter? Don't let it be on the Oh no. I was all over that horrible toilet. It was the most disgusting toilet. I, uh, I can't even like move my face right now. So that's when I started cleaning the toilets pretty regularly. I was like, oh god, that little psh. I had to take a video. I was like, this is what blew me over. Right in my face. I was devastated. Another good funny story when she first came here, uh we lived in town, right? And she had to go to Slayton to go to work. So she stopped, got her burrito for the morning, oh, yeah. is headed to work, and her window's down on the vehicle and goes by the feedlot. Which I was oh, new here, so I didn't know what it is. So, so I take the first by my burrito. That's a good burrito. And then I go by the feedlot with my mouth open. <laughs> Uh, and I was like locked up and I had to like tell myself swallow you idiot you know <laughs> it's like okay so you don't eat your burritos going by feedlots apparently <laughs> city girl learning the hard way what is that stuff in the air I said that's shog shog oh, yeah. yeah shit fog <laughs> <laughs>
phasing me out because I got rid of all the guys on the caboose. So I'm next. So just trying to get ahead of the wave and see what I want to be when I grow up still. <laughs> there were a thought at my age as a grandma that would be the thing, but here we go. You know. Yeah, her job might be a thing of the past. Uh, you know, they, they're, they're pushing they're now. They're trying one now. Man. They're trying. One man. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, asleep. Asleep. Or she You're in trouble. Yeah, the learner's going to do it. So the if trains, I don't hit that learner, then it's going to be The trains right now stop, have the technology to run themselves. A lot of times they get on, they just go, well, Jesus is driving. Okay, we just sit back. I mean, he doesn't even have to touch a thing. And that thing slows down, speeds up, and does everything by itself. So they, yes, sir. Basically, it's Every, like a cruise everything. control kind of. Yeah, so it, car. it speeds up, there it slows you. down as needed. And then we also have another new box. It's uh, it's called positive train control, which pretty much uh, shows us the limits of our authority. We'll never have a head-in, head-in collision. We'll never, all that's a thing of the past. It could still happen, but the, the chances are a whole lot less. Yeah. Can you explain that just a little more deeper, what you just said? Positive train control? Yes. Okay. It's a GPS so satellite system that communicates with satellites in the sky and sends back to the train. You can see your train on the screen going uphill. So it shows us the topography. Uh, it shows us the mileposts that we're coming up to, the crossings where each one is. So I know there's a crossing coming up, whatever I need to do. It goes so far as to even start the whistle sequence coming to the crossing. Oh, okay. It will start it for me. So at a quarter of a mile, quarter of a mile from the crossing, it's 1600 feet, 1620 feet. We have a whistle board, which is start blowing, alerting that we're coming through. And if he's just a second behind, he's putting the lid on his water bottle or anything, the train will start blowing the horn. Or but the positive train control keeps us from running into one another, or if uh something has happened on the track up ahead of us it it tells us that we have to comply with you know slowing down or maybe even stopping because of broken rail or uh could be so much as like a car rolled out of an industry onto our track so it's, it's a train great. control is a great thing it's a so great thing like, but yes. it's a job replacement mm -hmm. sure Smith, I'm saying, like, if there's a situation like what you've had with when there's that person who needed help, yeah, you know, that would be unsafe for just one person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There's so many things that are unsafe. What are we going to do with the Chinese shooter? Is that what? <laughs> that's 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 still, I believe that's in that. And, you know, honestly, that's something that I think is a great thing from when I came up into railroading. I still learn. I know how to do everything the old way where these guys who just hired out three years ago, they're completely reliant on the iPad and that PTC screen, and they don't know how to run an engine without it. So yeah, they, uh, it, they would block up real quick, whereas I could at least function for a good while. cruise control thing that I told you about, it, it's kind of taken the skill out of my job now because I don't have to sit there and physically think about what's two to three miles behind me. The computer does it. It, it throttles up or throttles down. So, if you're, you know, the way he used to run when we would work together, he'd be like, he would think about what's behind us and he would say, okay, at that gin right there, I need to slow down to this speed so I can be at this speed by the time I hit that hill. Or he knew landmarks, the big rock, big tree. Right. He knew how to run his train by looking at landmarks and looking did it. At telephone poles and see the the lay of the land. Sometimes it's hard to tell. If you know, a at hill the bottom of the hill, there's there's probably a, a, a culvert or a bridge. You know, if you see where a riverbed used to be, that's the bottom of the hill right there. Yeah, you're fixing to start up, so you need to start pulling. You know. Things like that, but it's kind of they're taking that skill out of it now with more, more and more. With that iPad, I mean, look it up on your when you get a chance, and you'll see if you see any grassroots efforts to stop one man crews. 
sign a petition and stop it. Get with your Congress people and let them know these are some uh, extreme uh, hazardous materials that are rolling through y'all's towns, right by your houses in the middle of the night when your kids are sleeping. Yeah. And if he's passed out or has had a medical emergency, yeah. God forbid, and I'm not there, you're in trouble. You know. That's and, the main reason I'm still on there. Because I'm your safety manager yeah. coming yeah. through this town. It's a big responsibility. It's a super cool job to ride trains. It's a big, it's a big responsibility when you start thinking about it and how what I do impacts you, affects you, could affect you. you know. So if the whistle wakes you up in the morning, that's because I'm doing my job. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Don't cuss us uh, out anymore. Say thanks. <laughs> you, you mentioned about you had one situation at suicide, but train could, does that happen? I mean, is that a common all the time? Really, especially during the holidays. Uh, I just wouldn't think of a train as a good way to. I mean, I'm sure it, you accomplish. Yeah, he got what he set out, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, that was in Norman, Oklahoma, for me, and that's a college town. Oh, okay. So they experienced that quite a lot. We had 17 crossings through there that are all quiet zones. We don't even blow our whistle at all. That's the city's wise yeah. idea, you know. And Say that. Explain that a little bit more. How do you? How they determine that quiet zone? Like they that. have to, I think, petition the federal government or whatever, and they have to pay for all the signage the and they, measures, to, yeah. to put up that this is a quiet zone, it's a no blow zone. We have one in Lubbock. Wow. Uh, but it, it has its own whistle system on it. It's got horns. So when a turn, train turn. approaches, it starts blowing this whistle. It's a quiet, quieter version. But it's quieter than ours. But uh, so, yeah. We came through there, it was about 2.30, 2.15 in the morning, one morning, came around a big bend. And the weirdest part of the story is, my engineer was just telling me a story about a guy he hit a month ago. And he looked at me, he said, though I never hit anybody oh, again, oh, no. that'd be all right by me. And we looked out the window, I said, what is that? And it was a shopping cart that I could see. And then when I realized my eyes dropped down, there was a black man sitting on the engineer's rail with his back to us. I could see his spine and, Just and everything. He was like rocking. Waiting. Yeah, oh, and I yeah. thought, that goes against everything in your body. You hear that horn, and we came through there screaming. I mean, wailing that horn. And for him to have the ability to stay put, those were some demons he was facing, you oh, know. Yes. And, uh, you know, plugged it. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Me said, hey, man, 31, it's emergency. Uh, mainline woman up to hit a pedestrian. They don't train you for that. There's no training. You can't <clears throat> recreate those. On moments. the job training. No, it's, it's immediate. They don't tell you what to say, what not to say, what to do, what not to do. I just, it was like instinct kicked in. And it was, I had an out of body experience. I don't know how to explain it, but I could, it was like I was standing at the back of the engine. I could see the back of my head, what I was wearing, what was on the screens. I could see it all playing out. It's the weirdest thing. And uh, I just strapped up and looked at my engineer. He was yeah. shaking, and I looked at him and I hugged him. I said, "You did your job, and now I gotta go do mine." Called off the back and I called him on my phone. He was dead asleep. I said, "Baby, we just hit him." Yeah. <clears throat> and I went back, and about two thirty in the morning, there's some bars around, so they were starting to kind of let out, you know. And I, now I'm having to like clear the scene because all these bar patrons oh. are coming out because they heard us. Normally we don't whistle, you know, it's quiet. And I'm like, get away from the tracks, get away from the tracks. And this guy out of nowhere, he says, ma'am, are you okay? I said, yeah, I think, you know. He says, well, I've got a Sprite coming for you. Oh, do you need anything else? All of a sudden, I'm like, like all of a sudden, my mouth is like hot. And he was on the phone at this time. And I said, no, I'm okay. You have a bottle of water. Yeah. He says, I'm a combat veteran from Iraq, and I'm here to tell you that you need a sugar to help you to keep from going into shock. But if you'd like a bottle of water, I'll be happy to get one for you. And the bartender right across the street. He said, babe, it sounds like you've got good help with your job. Do, do they provide counseling for you after something like that? You know, they, they say they do. Um, they will we, if, you... if you... You have to ask for it. Sure. Uh, we get three days off with pay. And it's not even full pay. Uh, it's about a quarter of the pay. So you're putting a guy up against a situation where if he can't put food on the yeah. table for his kids, he's got to go right back out to work. And is he mentally stable to do it? Um, I went back the next day. I got called by the medical department on my way to work. And 
they're like, are you sure you've got all this time? And I said, I was trying to be polite. I'm fine, thank you, please. Because I finally kept pushing and pushing. I said, look, I may be a little bit too John Wayne for you, but thanks, but no thanks. You're three days and the rest of my life I have to deal with this. Your three yeah. days mean nothing to me. And I've got to get back on the horse and ride. So I appreciate it if you leave me alone. He said, well, if you need more time off, call us back. <laughs> and the first trip through that same place, I cried. You know, yeah. it was as a mom, as a wife, as a, it, it's very, you know, but that was the only death I've had. Yeah. The John Deere tracker was a young kid out of Hermely racing me. Uh -huh. Here we come. He thought he could beat us, and he did. Just he maybe. got across the crossing. He came to a dead stop, but what he forgot was the six feet of cake works behind him. Boom, we hit it spun him around, spun him into us, ripped out my brake cylinder, ripped off my metal handrails. Uh, so I bail off again, mercy, 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 you know. I'm off running, I'm running, I'm like, what, is, what am I looking at? Why does this look funny? And then I look, I'm like, where did he go? Off, his little tractor was wobbling off down the dirt road. And I thought, my dispatcher goes, can you give me a description of the vehicle? I said, a big green one! You know, <laughs> you know it's missing. <laughs> But it was a, he looked, I mean, and when you get that close, you vividly see their faces and their eyes. And he was about a 19 year old kid who had to go tell grandpa that he ruined his $200,000 tractor. But, you know, luckily, he, you know, and then the guy we hit last month or so with the Mrs. Barrett's uh, truck had hobos and quickies and all that in there, you know, he just didn't even see us. We just, and we were blowing, 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 and he just kept on and. There, he, he was sitting right here as a driver, and we hit just right behind oh. him. I mean, if he would have been a second slower, we would have nailed him square. He would not have survived. Mm -hmm. um, did he say, did he have the music on? No, or? we knocked his shoes and socks off. Uh, his socks went flopping when I got to him. Um, no music was playing. Well, the horn was honking. Why he didn't hear? He had no idea. Even three hours later, after the paramedics and everybody evaluated, he put the hold of off with the tow truck. He came and he said, can you tell me what happened? I said, I wish I could do. We tried to blow that horn to save your life. And, you know, all I know is you've got a story to tell most people don't. So you better start living that. Yeah. You know, you've just been given a second chance. Yeah. yeah. So. so when you get somebody like that, you're stuck, right? Yeah. Hello? I don't guess there is an answer. I it's personally really stay. Yeah, I stay until the officials are gone, the, you know, police officers and all that. Usually they send us a relief crew. I stay until the relief crew gets there to let them know whatever information I need to share with them. Yeah, we've, we've got to uh, contact our immediate supervisors. And a lot of times they come out, and if it's especially like if it were a fatality, then they download what they the do is download the, the tapes off the engine. The engines have basically a back flat box, just like an airplane, or so it. it tracks all of the events uh, up and to from the whistle blow yeah, to the air being set to the video it all winds up as a big evidence anyway so case. in a court case over a fatality they the, that would be the railroad's proof that I had my lights on I blew the whistle the bell was ringing we did our best everything so sometimes to answer that question would be you know, it might take a little while for an official to drive out to us and then they plug their computer in on my computer and download all that information. And then if that engine's tore up, you know. It's like a traffic accident. Our insurance company's going to come call you. Yeah. And then you're going to get to pay for repairs on locomotive, which you can imagine aren't going to be cheap. But you have to have schedules, so that messed up the schedule. Like yes, right? definitely. Yeah. So there, there are delays involved there, and whoever caused the accident is going to incur those. The charges. railroad will bill you. If I hit you because you came out in front of me, not only do you get to pay for the damage to my engine, if you get to pay for the delay, if it exceeds a certain amount, you're going to suffer. Yeah. And if there are other trains behind, I'm a very slow uh, uh, passenger car or small SUV. The physics is essentially the same as you stepping on a cocaine. Oh gosh. It, I mean, it, it will reduce <coughs> to nothing. 
the SUVs well, I mean, that coach How much damage will it do to the engine? Uh, generally, not a whole lot. Uh, we got it, it damaged from that tractor because we spun him around yeah. back into us and it ripped up some of our stuff on the side. Um, but generally, those cow catchers on the front yeah. do their trick. But yeah, it's essentially the same. Those things are designed to push things away from you. Doesn't, doesn't say that, you know, something could get hung up under it too. Underneath them engines, you know, you're only about this high off the ground. So if something does, like an engine block rolls up underneath that thing, well, now you're going to tear up underneath that engine, which are traction motors. Yeah. Well, that's what powers our engines, you know, is what gives us the ability to go. They are not too 